I used to tell people that I was the happiest like Canadian in the world. Like, you know, I, I every day I, I walked up to the Pentagon, it was like showing up on set of a movie, you know, and I'm, and we wear the, we have the big Canadian flag on our shoulder and I perpetuated the myth of the nice Canadian because I would always say good Is morning. Is it a myth? Yeah, well, yeah, a little bit, a little bit. Um, I, I, so I would, I would say good morning and good afternoon to everybody I saw in the hallways. That's like hundreds and thousands of people that are wandering around there. Right. And I know that one day someone is going to be talking about Canadians and say, you know, there was this guy in the Pentagon (laughs) that said hello to me every day and I never knew him. This podcast is about real estate with intelligence. It is pulling the sword from the stone. This podcast is about that unique balance in real estate that balance between technological intelligence and our emotional intelligence and the transactions and interactions with one another in the real estate process that's why we're inviting expert guests people who are knowledgeable and bring different perspective join me in exploring this fascination the look behind the scenes of technological advancement and how it's interacting with people's decisions in real estate Well, welcome to the podcast today, Real Estate with Intelligence with David Ferris, my favorite American Canadian, Canadian American. What, what? I'm just Canadian, actually. I'm a permanent <laughs> resident, but yeah. that's it. And you know, your journey as both an entrepreneur, mm. as a business consultant, as a military consultant and military officer, formerly, mm. Um, it's been an interesting one. Tell us a little bit about, we're here talking about real right. estate and intelligence. Talk to us a little bit about your real estate journey to the yeah. U.S., to this area, and what that's looked like for you. Sure. So uh, I'll say that, you know, everybody that serves in the military, especially if you, you know, serve for, you know, a number of years, you move a lot, right? So every military person should theoretically be like an expert in real estate, but Inevitably, you know, it doesn't always work out that way, right? So we, I joined the military in Canada in kind of right after September 11, actually, and um, spent my time, had a kind of very traditional time in the infantry, served in Afghanistan, and then got kind of scooped up into the counter IED community. So uh, the improvised explosive device, so countering those devices, um, working with different militaries around the world. And that actually brought me here to the United States after my last deployment to Ukraine. Um, we were, I, I, I got a, a position in the Pentagon. And, you know, between 2002 and 2016, when we moved here, uh, I think we had moved eight times or seven times as a family. And so um, I remember my dad was in the military. He was in, he was a pilot, Um and he remarkably still spoke to me after I joined the army. But he <laughs> he used to say the biggest mistake he made was not understanding real estate better in his military career. So he he told us about some of his sort of peers and superiors that had navigated real estate successfully during their military career. So by the time I retired from the military and we stayed here in the D.C. area, we had four houses in Canada that we had we had lived in ourselves. And then when we had been moved or posted to another base, we kind of held on to it and rented it out. So we started our own little, uh, you know, real estate empire, if you will, in Canada, which no longer exists. But anyway, so Canada does, the real estate (laughs) empire doesn't. Um, And, you know, so when we came here, um, we, we moved into McLean, Virginia. And at that point, you know, I wouldn't say we were experts by any stretch, uh, but but we had a good handle on um, the military kind of life and what that means for, you know, lots of moves and for your family and things like that. So it was a deeply personal thing for us and for obviously, as you well know, but for the folks that don't know, that's actually how Tommy and I first met. He was our real estate agent when we moved here and helped us find our home. And if I could you know, kind of close out the, the, the journey to us staying here. 
Um, part of why we stayed here, one, it's obviously the people we met um, in a great environment. The schools were wonderful. And, and that is connected directly to the home that we were living in, right? And so, and then obviously Jen, my wife, started to do some work with you and, and entered into, a, you know, into a career in real estate herself. Um, and then, you know, I just stayed on the margins of your great success uh, and connected to, to sort of your community. I think, though, for especially for the military, you know, for military families that move a lot, you realize that, you know, the home, you know, home is where the heart is, right? You can always make something work for a couple of years, but that actually can make the difference between where you are physically and geographically can make the difference between whether or not your family deems that like a, you know, a memorable time in your family's experience. So. Yeah, we, I mean, we've, I've hired you as a consultant mm -hmm. as well over the years and um, you have your own side consulting opportunity and gig and um, work with a lot of different clients and um, and firms in the uh, with military and uh, programs and uh, DOD consulting, et cetera. So, you know, what's interesting to me is in our, the consulting I've done with you is how you've seen the lifestyle effect or the journey of someone's life and how it relates to the home and those moves. And we've, we've spent a lot of time talking about, okay, well, you know, like the, it's not just about this transaction. It's about mm. helping people throughout their life and what their needs are in real estate over time. But really no one sees that. Very few people see that as often as the military families, because they're constantly moving and, and not always on their own volition. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think it's, it's, if you could describe a little bit more the effect of that perspective in how, you know, having a family and redefining home every few years, yeah. is there a longing to, to anchor <laughs> down or is there a, is there is an acceptance on, on rebuilding what home really means in a different way than most people do? Wow. Okay. So that's, that's, that's a great sort of question around what makes a home a home almost. Right. So, um, I wouldn't, again, we're not experts. We've successfully moved our family, you know, however many times over the last 20 years, I think I would say you'll see military families, you get, you get a rhythm. Right. I, one of my favorite stories, this guy that I, I used to serve with, he would say that when they when their next move came around, right, they'd be in their house for a year or two and then they'd get told they got to they got orders. They got to move to their next post and they would go into the basement and any box that was still a moving box from the last move, they wouldn't even open it. They'd just put it, put it to the curb <laughs> like, well, if we didn't open it in the last year or two, we clearly don't need it. So. We did not have that kind of philosophy. That's how they minimized, right? There's this sort of, there's different camps, if you will, right? Like we're, we're the folks that just, we just lived our life in our home and then purged when it was time to move and downsize to the next one. I think the rhythm we would, I would say that we got into, we always chose based on um, the quality of life our children would experience, right? So it was all about finding the right place with the right schools. Did it have a good, you know, walking score? Were there parks nearby? Um, everything from in Canada, obviously a hockey rink or, you know, parks and things like that. You know, if I could, if we could set our family up for the most success, then it sort of didn't matter. Well, there's a whole, I, I can commute. I can suffer and commute 30 minutes or 45 minutes to a job, Um and things like that. So finding that right place where the kids would be happy because it's all about the kids. Um, we also always involved our kids in every step of the process. We would bring all four of them to on our house hunting trips when we were looking for a new place to live, which is chaos. You, you probably remember what it was like showing our family of six a home. We had one cartwheel disaster, I think, with a <laughs> with someone that hit their head on a floor and, um, you know, but, but having them involved made it easier, made it better for them, right? So I think, you know, just getting into that rhythm is important as a military family. Um, it's, it's important for any family. But again, the frequency of our relocations, right? And, and some of our, 
I, I think our shortest, we had two one-year postings where you're just there, you do a year of school and you punch out. Yeah, so this is fascinating. You know, I think most people would say, oh, the hardship mm. of having to move all the time. I think that's that's very real. Like yep. it, it's, you're never comfortable. Flip it though for a second and share with us, you know, are there positives you've seen with your family? Like the ability to adapt to new situations quicker than maybe most of their peers, like most of your kids' peers, because they've gone through this process of, or, you know, like the, I think that the, the hardship is pretty clear and is talked about often, but what are the positives that yeah. come out of adapting to this lifestyle? Yeah. So we can actually see it across the kids, right? Because our oldest, when we moved here, um, he started seventh grade and it was his fifth school and seventh move, I think at that point or eighth move for him because Jen and I had had a couple of moves before we had kids. And then our little guy, I think it was his third, but he's unique in our family because he's done all elementary school and now middle school in the same school with the same group of kids. So we can actually sort of compare and contrast, right? And and I would say that, um, of course, every kid's different, but there's this, uh, there's, a, there's a level, there's a resilience that comes with moving a lot. Um, I think I would say on a spectrum, our oldest has deeper friendships, sort of that with, with you know, he forms these, these bonds uh, with a couple of kids um, that he's held on to. I mean, he's still friends with a couple of kids up in Canada. Our little guy doesn't have that. He has a, a number of friends down here, a big group of friends that he's kind of gone through six years of elementary school and now two years or well, a year of middle school and he'll be in eighth grade next year. So he's got a big range of friends because it's just he's not used to that change and that having to move. So I think um, and I think most military families would say their kids sort of, you know, the more you move you'll hang on to one or two sort of strong relationships. And we've even ended up kind of connecting back up with some of those families over the years because you do form rapid bonds sometimes, right? I mean, you and I actually, I think are a perfect example of that. You were a real estate agent, right? And and um, just in, enjoyed each other's company, if you will. And then like, hey, let, where, where, what should we do? Let's Let's go work out together. Let's Let's go train. And so we started just hanging out. Our family started hanging out. And then Jen worked for you. And, you know, and so that was rapid. And I think it was less than six months. You and I were like running around in Georgetown carrying sandbags. And I was like, I get to do that. What am I doing this for? I, this is ridiculous. But it was good. It was fun. Well, so th those relationships that you carry through, you know, you never know where they're going to come from and which mm. ones are going to be more meaningful. I think it's interesting how you, how you see that there's a journey of, of that as well. You know, when you talk about what do you look for in those relationships that says, Oh, this is going to be one that's going to be maybe a little longer last year. And this is one that I want to reconnect with if I'm ever back in the same zip code yeah. or, or region as uh, someone that was meaningful to me in the past. Yeah, I think um, I would say most of our most of our friends that like in our in our community right now, it sort of falls in under two different groups. They're parents of kids that our kids hang out with, or um, like you, in that early year or two, we formed a pretty strong friendship. Um, and so for me personally, you know, um, I love the camaraderie that the mil that I got from, from the military. Um, I, and even now, you know, there's, there's days where you miss that, right. You miss waking up and, and showing up to work with 500 like-minded, you know, similarly dressed people. <laughs> um, I, I, but you're all part of the same team, right? So there's, there's something in that, right? So finding a community of like-minded people that you can, um, work with or, uh, or just hang out with and spend time with that's, that's sort of rare. Right. So I like, you know, you and I, I think are again, a good example of we've, you know, kind of over the years been weaving in and out of like working together and I've helped, you know, you and, and, and in the early days of the company and then just hanging out 
going to the gym together a few a couple of months ago, I think. And sometimes we'll go a year or two, right, without connecting, just emailing and texting back and forth. But um, and I have very few friendships like that. A couple still from the military, um, and then a few from outside the military. I think for me personally, I I think I am. Um, I'm always, I like the, the, the more meaningful, obviously friendships that I have where the folks that I hang out with, you know, there's a little bit of like-mindedness there, but also challenging the thinking, which again, you and I spent a lot of time in conference rooms kind of debating in, you know, some of the early days of your company, how you were going to structure it, how you were going to form it. And the ideas that you had, you challenged a lot of my thinking around, I mean, not just real estate, but sort of around entrepreneurship, I think, which I found fascinating and I still lean on to this day. Well, that's interesting. I, uh, I, since this is about real estate with intelligence, yeah. there's a couple of really interesting things. You, know, you, from your perspective, what do you think, you know, with all the technological advancement, all the talk mm-hmm. of AI, you know, what do you see coming for the real estate industry from someone who's not on the inside of the real estate yeah. industry now? So... I mean, I, I follow this extremely closely, not just because, you know, you and I worked together in the past. Um, I think there's very there are very few industries that are still operating the same way they were 50 years ago, but this appears to be one of them. I, and I mean, I think we'll talk about the residential real estate kind of market. Um, and there are technologies, you know, you and I, you, had, you, you were trying to bring on some technology in the early days of Chambers Theory. That, that were cool, but I think this industry is really ripe for disruption um, in the sense that, you know, every home, it's still a very deeply personal thing, right? So it's, and there's this idea, I'll say, I don't want to, I, I hesitate to use the myth of like home ownership uh, as an asset, but we, but a lot of people operate like that, right? There's some good financial advice out there that might question that. I think it's very difficult to bundle something so deeply personal as your home with also your investment in your future, maybe your retirement. But that's still a very common, I mean, we see lots of people these days that are investing their money in their home and they might be using that as their future asset. So one of the things that I love about real estate um, is, is, is how personal it is for people, right? Like it, and it should be. And it, it doesn't mean that your home has to be perfect, but it has to serve your purposes uh, extremely well, right? It's got to be the right place. It's got to, uh, it's not just location, location, and location, but it's also about the aesthetics. Like there's so many things that, that apply to each individual. What I love about real estate with intelligence is that, you know, you approach it from the perspective of the uniqueness of the individual and the problem you're trying to solve. You are solving problems. You're not selling homes, which I think the way, which I think has always fascinated me about what you do. And I think from an industry perspective, it is such a transactional, you know, it it is an environment full of, uh, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like that it's, it's a trend. There's a lot of transactional relationships in real estate, which is like many businesses, but not every business is tied to something that's deeply personal as the home someone is living in. And then they're trying to sell it in order to buy their next home. You only have to, you could pick up any paper or go on any website right now. That's news related and see a story about a crisis in housing somewhere whether it's in Canada or the United States or in Europe, pick a city, a province, a state, it doesn't matter. There are housing crises everywhere. And that's a little bit shocking to me when it's the one thing you know the entire planet needs, right? Everyone needs somewhere to live. So how we end up in these crises a little bit baffles me. And I think today I would offer that it is because the industry hasn't changed in the, as, as at the same pace that, frankly, culturally we're changing and um at the same pace that new technologies and new you know and and other ways of doing business are kind of coming about so i think i think ai you know i so i'm in a supply chain risk management company right now we have a a a platform that uses ai and machine learning and so 
I would say that the data exists. There's data out there that could help us solve this problem. And, you know, when we look at these housing crises from a different, through a different lens, um, I'm just not sure. I'm just not sure the industry actually wants to solve some of those problems necessarily. I, I find it really quirky. I guess I think it might be the word that you have this affordable housing crisis issue. And yet there's also a lot more work remotely, work from home mm. availability. Yes, it does put more value on the home as both the place you work from and a place you live from. Yet if you can work from anywhere it's it seems that the distribution of value would be would be smooth out and, and it wouldn't be so based on location 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 which mm. is historically what the real estate industry's you know flag is in, in the ground to say hey that that's what it's really about the value is really tied to i always say it has nothing to do with location it has everything to do with negotiation <laughs> <laughs> but you know it's interesting that it hasn't smoothed out the the demand, the demand is still so high in some areas and less high in other areas. If you can work from any area, yeah. you'd think there would be some smoothing of that that issue. Yeah. So, I mean, I think when we, when you and I looked at this a few years ago, um, we did. I think if you remember, we were doing an analysis of like the prop, like we were trying to project, um, like a TAM for your company in the region, and I I pulled out a study on um the prices the pricing of homes in and around the the metro like the rail metro rail system and so to understand that like 50 percent of this region's real estate wealth in the residential real estate is within a mile of a metro stop right that's that's intuitive but that's also an astronomical number um when you think of 50 percent or whatever the number was but it was it was high so that you know, and that's because of commuting and schools and, you know, how, how we develop, how we just develop kind of urban uh, environments. So I remember um, talking to a guy b before COVID in 2019, and there was a county up in Maryland that they were investing in broadband internet, spent an, a fortune bringing it to the entire county, rural areas as well. And the hope was to attract remote workers. And this was before COVID. And so they were like, yeah, we're not sure if it's going to work out. And then, <laughs> of course, it worked out really well about a year later when, <laughs> when people were like, well, I, I'm, I don't need to be here in the city anymore. I can move. Right. And our company, so that the company I work for now in Taros, we hired um, the bulk of our folks during COVID. So we are, I think 39% of our employees or somewhere around there live in and around the DC area where we're headquartered in Arlington. So the other 60 odd percent live in right from Texas to New York, you know, all over. And I mean, and it works, right? It works. I think the distribution, right? So now, now to go back to that Maryland County example that invested in the infrastructure to allow remote employees to not just function, you got to be able to flourish. You got to be able to thrive in that environment. So, you know, you, you have to, and that's a technology problem. You got to be able to bring in the right, you got to be able to bring in the internet and it has to be good enough that if you're writing code or if you're on calls all the time, or if you're working in a platform like often we are you've got to have the bandwidth right and so we're, and we're not there yet and what else do you need to do do you need different types of schools and things like that so but it is interesting because it's still commuting infrastructure if you will in other words the 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 metro or this the subway it's mm. it's commuting infrastructure clearly yeah right so, yeah. so we could all get to our office uh, as an easy infrastructure. Yeah. how do you get to your community. office by the internet and yet the investment in broadband was an investment in commuting infrastructure. They just didn't quite see it as commuting infrastructure at that time. Yeah. Uh, and I think, you know, the other thing I'll say is, um, so I, I work mostly in the public sector environment right now. The government's not going to get away anytime soon from this idea of Monday to Friday, eight to five. Um, but elements of our company or really any company that's out there right now that touches technology not everybody has to work that traditional sort of eight to five, nine to five gig, right? Um, a colleague of mine from one of the companies that we partner with, she said she's never going to go back 
to a regular routine because she gets, you know, she works a couple hours in the morning, does her thing. She has like a 14 hour work day is the way she describes it, but she's still only working eight hours a day. She just works at her own pace. And so I look at that and I think, you know, that that's, there's a lot of value in that, right? Because um, companies now have access to talent in a way that they wouldn't have five, 10 years ago. On the flip side of that, the government's not getting away from this idea of what a work week looks like, right? So they're the biggest employer in the world, the U.S. government, right? So, so, <laughs> and and but even when you look at it from the perspective of how schools are set up and things like that, it makes it, um, it makes this idea of where we invest in infrastructure, right? How do you how do you invest in new infrastructure or repurpose old infrastructure to serve sort of this new you know, this, the, to serve the purpose of solving the crisis, right? And as I, you know, as we've said many times in our discussions, you're solving problems. You're not just putting people in houses. You're solving, you're creating solutions. And, and I think um, it's going to take um, people, frankly, like you, that look at real estate differently, that kind of flip the model in the sense of, you know, you're not just a traditional uh, residential sales and leasing, you do property management, your employees, you incentivize them in a, in a different way. You have a different model and structure, which allows your employees to serve the customer in a different way, I think, than the traditional industry would as well. So how do you take that? How do you scale that up and to start solving some of these larger real estate problems, um, especially now when it's exasperated by, exacerbated, excuse me, by uh, um, all these other crises around that we have right now. I mean, mm. the cost of borrowing money, you know, the the supply chain issues. Like we have this, and then now we have this, the hottest summer on record in ages. Is that going to change the migration pattern we've been <clears throat> seeing in the United States for a number of years down to like the Southwest? I mean- I would look at I would be very interested to see what happens in the Phoenix area over the next five years if this is a consistent yeah. you know kind of climate behavior. I read they had their uh, Phoenix had their first day under 110 yeah. degrees in two weeks yesterday. Once again, you and I probably read the same. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and I think so just to kind of close that thought out though, I think to tie this back to technology, if we can if you can start to look at the data and if you can see if you can understand motivation as a predictor of behavior in people, because ultimately real estate is always going to be about people. Um, if you can start to use data to inform the business decisions that you make, um, I think you. Can, I think this again. This this industry is ripe for disruption, and I think you can see you'll be able to take advantage of some of those shifts in in behavior around the migration that people do here in the United States and technology. If there's one place, I think data, big data could help. It's understanding that the patterns that could influence sort of your business decisions down the road. migration. Yeah. yeah. And then where do you need to make where where do where do counties and states need to make investments? And mm -hmm. you know, where's the right place to build a school? I mean, if I'm and I, you know, it's probably the same article. They were talking about this like these states that people viewed as like climate safe right michigan being one of them and you know i mean same in canada right like there's lots of places in canada that people are like oh this is going to be amazing hey we're burning right they were yeah. on fire That's and right. ridiculously hot and there's no air conditioning so while it's not 110 degrees it's all relative yeah no it's uh this is actually i, I love that this came up because the climate discussion in real estate is something I'm passionate about. Mm. You know, often there's not an opportunity to really discuss it with others who have paid attention to it, and you you, you bring it up. And when you bring it up with migration, we're, we're talking about whether or not you believe in climate change. I think is becoming less and less of a question anymore. How much of the effect is now more of the question? Mm. And you know, clearly. Um, with the effect, one of the discussion points is the rising in sea levels. Mm. And 70% of the world's population lives right on the coast. 
And if you talk about a massive migration in real estate in the future, you know, how are either cities going to combat the rising sea levels to protect their real estate in the homes and the offices and workplaces and communities that, that are there? Or at some point, do you not invest into infrastructure to try to keep out the rising sea levels and everybody's got to move to Michigan or mm. Canada or wherever else is, is, is uh, the new coastline, if you will. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think, I mean, this is, this is a discussion that started years ago and it's going to continue for another 25 years. Again, I'll go back to data right now, right? Like, so there's an enormous amount of data on, um, on this risk. And we'll talk about it in terms of risk actually, because um, one, you know, we, our company, we look at supply chain risk, um, ingest data to do that. And, but one of the areas of risk we look at is catastrophic risk. So talking about weather and natural disasters, so like earthquakes and things like that. So the data exists, you can overlay popul you know, urban centers and population and, and even businesses. So you can actually look at these, this risk in terms of impact to a local economy or to a, an or, you know, a company supply chain, you can look at it a number of different ways. So understanding that there will be an impact. I mean, that's, you know, the, the data can feed that. What is the, the next question though, is, you know, understanding the motivation to predict the behavior, right? So there will be a migration. That is, you know, and I, I use that term sort of because it will it will be entire regions that start to shift. And it's already starting right now. We were, you know, people were talking about the, num the number of folks that have been relocating to places like Texas and Arizona over the last few years, um, even Florida, right? And then that slowly started to stop. And now is there going to be a reversal, right? And so taking advantage of that, um, and I don't mean in sort of that transactional sense. I mean, I mean, actually solving these problems and creating solutions for people. So, so where, because where the migration from Texas and Arizona isn't the issue of rising sea levels. It's the opposite. It's, yeah. it's where, where is there right. going to be any water? In, That's right. So, all? so it's, it's, it's a, I mean, it's a wicked problem, right? However, it is, it has the easiest solution because at fundamentally, you're moving from place one one point to another. Like you just you can't live there anymore, so you have to live somewhere else. That is the solution. So doing that, you know, now you're looking at it from well, how do you do that to create this? You know, so you and I have talked about this, right? The city of the future, and at one point, you know, we were spitballing ideas like repurposing, you know, like malls. Sorry, I hit the microphone. Repurposing malls or other areas and and like Las Vegas was built with purpose. How do you build cities now with purpose as well? Now that we have all of this data, now that we have all of this information, start to think about real estate from this from the perspective of like creating the community from, you know, from the ground up if you will, literally. Yeah. And du then Dubai is created with purpose. Yep. Las Vegas created with purpose. Saudi Arabia is now doing it as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think I think we have this, if you look at sort of that, what the comment I made previously around 50% of the real estate wealth being tied to the metro system here, right? Well, just look at 70% you know, of the world's population living on coastlines, then look at how the interstate and the arteries in the, you know, in, in the United States drive, um, um, you know, the, 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 where our urban centers are located or vice versa. So, you know, you look at Canada, we have one trans Canada highway that goes East West across the country and 80% of our population in Canada lives within like, I think it's something like 25 miles of the U S border. So we serve, you know, that highway serves 80% of the Canadian population just by running a little bit North of the U S border from one coast to the other. So understanding like, okay, maybe we need to make more investments in the art, you know, the arteries that flow off of the, the, that sort of one highway across the country and, and drive, open up those opportunities in a, in a way that, um, allows, allows people to start to, to move away from those areas of risk. Yeah. And, 
you know, when you talk about risk and risk assessment, and one of the things that comes to mind for me is is all of the uh, risk assessments that the Pentagon does, and, and talk about a, a, an interesting place of real estate. Mm. I mean, the, the Pentagon is almost like it's its own city within, right? Um, and I actually had the opportunity to to visit the Pentagon as, as a guest of yours. Mm. You know, I, I couldn't get into the Pentagon as an American, but I could with my my favorite Canadian. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, Everybody likes us. That's why. Give a little bit of insight for people that will never get a chance to, to step into the Pentagon. What you're allowed to say, just sure. you know, like like what is it like in there? And just it really blew my mind when I got a chance to go in there with you. Oh, I appreciate that. So, so, well, I mean, imagine how I felt and, and like, no joke, you are, you know, you grew up, I think within 50 miles of where we are right now. Right. So you grew up in Virginia near the Pentagon or did you grow up in Alaska? I, I, I was also a, uh, not a military brat, but, uh, lived a little bit all over the world. Yeah. So, um, for Canadian, right? The Pentagon is the thing you see as you drive by it on the highway, maybe, or mostly in movies. Um, and so to get posted down and spend two years working on real problems on the joint staff, like every day, you know, it was it was a great place to be working with some incredible professionals from across the, the U.S. military, as well as our Five Eyes allies. And I used to tell people that I was the happiest like Canadian in the world. Like, you know, I, I every day I, I walked up to the Pentagon, it was like showing up on set of a movie, you know, and I'm and we wear the we have the big Canadian flag on our shoulder. And I perpetuated the myth of the nice Canadian because I would always say good Is morning. Is it a myth? Yeah, well, yeah, a little bit. A little bit. Um I, I so I would I would say good morning and good afternoon to everybody I saw in the hallways. That's like hundreds and thousands of people that are wandering around there, right? And I know that one day someone is going to be talking about Canadians and say, you know, there was this guy in the Pentagon <laughs> that said hello to me every day. And I never knew him. Um, but it was. It was, a, it was an incredible experience. And I think, you know, being there, working on, uh, you know, the being part of this group countering violent extremist organizations around the world um, and you know, serving in a U.S. billet. So I was actually part of the joint staff. I was part of the team. It, it was an amazing experience. And one that I think was, you know, it, it actually, I feel like it did allow me, I did retire early, right? And, and that job allowed me to kind of feel pretty good about my career up to that point. I deployed to Afghanistan. I deployed to Ukraine during that time and set up a you know, a, a mission in Southeast Asia as well. Um, so to come and, and close out my military career during the height of the fight against ISIS, working with some of those, you know, some of the greatest professionals on the planet, uh, it, it was an amazing experience. And one, right, that I wanted to share, you know, finding out that you hadn't been in the Pentagon, being able to share some of that with you and and uh, see kind of see it through your eyes as well was, was a lot of fun. I think... Um, what was amazing to me uh, in the Pentagon is, you know, I've been there since the, you know, to brief, um, to provide a few briefings in the last couple of years. The changes since 2017, 2018, and, and now are are quite like incredible because there's not as many people working there. They've determined that a large number of people can work remotely. And so they're allowing some of that remote work to continue. Um, it's a different environment. Not doesn't appear to have the same pace, but I know that what's going on behind some of those walls, it's just as fast paced. It's just as important. It's just as incredible, you know, the kind of work that they're doing there. One of the questions I like to ask you, you, you talk about the, the, the myth of the happy Canadian. Yeah, yeah. And you perpetuated that is... Is there a TV character or movie character that, that you really relate with or, you know, that you have an affinity towards? Yeah. So I, I is, it, is it, is it Barbie? Is that why you got the pink shirt today? No, okay. <laughs> maybe no, it's um. so I actually, I, my kids make fun of me cause I'm a bit grumpy sometimes. So, and, but the movie, one of my favorite movies is actually Disney's up. Love that movie. And the old guy, Carl, in that movie is my favorite. <laughs> and, you know, he's... And the reason is because he's he's grumpy. He likes his life the way he likes his life. But he, he, you know, this, like, 
incredible moment of like crazy bravery where he attaches balloons to his house and he takes off and he flies, flies his house down to South America. Um, and then he forms this like really cool friendship with someone. Um, I like, I, I love that character. I think it's one of the best characters out there in movies. And, you know, again, my kids make fun of me all the time because I'm that, I'm that grumpy old guy that like <laughs> people come to the door. I'm like, what do you want? Um, <laughs> There's definitely some contrast with that and, and the happy Canadian. <laughs> there, there is, there is the myth of the, the myth of the nice Canadian. Well, I perpetuate that in the Pentagon. I oh, didn't do okay. that anywhere else. Now you're trying to be a friendly ally. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Well, that's actually why they asked me to leave Canada is because I'm so grumpy. <laughs> um, any other interesting insights that you want to bring to the real estate mm. industry or to this podcast just to say, hey, you know, based on my experience, based on all the discussions, all the things we've talked about, you know, this would be my advice for a young military family mm. in their real estate moves. Or this would be my advice for... Um, someone going into the business of how to to look at how climate change and the risk analysis. Yeah. You know, if you're if you're interested in getting into that, and more and more businesses are. You know, look at this. You know, t pick your perspective. Pick your uh, yeah. Play there. So um, so we lived on like on on post when we were in our first military posting as a family. Um. Which was, you know, living on base is a great experience, uh, and and one that uh, I didn't do as a young military guy because I joined the military later in life, so I was already married, you know, and and just had a different sort of arc of my career. Um, what I would say is, we had we were very very lucky moving, taking doing our first move from a military base to buying our first home as a family. And um, our very first real estate agent set the stage for our success for the rest of our sort of career. I am still in touch with that individual and have referred business to him nearly, we're now at 16, 17 years later. This is in Ottawa? No, no, this is actually up in, in Oromocto, New Brunswick which is uh, where give him a uh, shout out. Who yeah, is yeah. it? Who Mike is Tid, Mike Tid's the legend. So, okay. and, and he was referred to me by one of my good friends in the battalion at the time. And the reason I'm bringing that up on this podcast is that there are, you know, there are real estate agents out there that need to understand the impact that in, you know, you as a professional can have on that military family. And the advice he gave us was it was advice that we still sort of, um, uh, you know, that we we still follow to this day. Um, but more importantly, the personal nature of that engagement, how how much it mattered, how much our family's happiness mattered to him, the investment he made in us, you know, as a sort of as a customer, and then you know over the years, whether it was to help him or not. He's still a sounding board for us. So I think, you know, the advice I would give to real estate professionals is that particularly for military families, right? Understanding that the service requirements that that family unit uh, endures, the impact you can have on that family during that, that week or five days, you might be helping them find their home. That, that, that can, that can affect sort of, you know, that entire career trajectory because again, it's, he's influenced sort of our approach to real estate over the years. And he's still someone that we reflect back on. And then frankly, it is, you know, it's like, it's the, the measure of a real estate agent in our mind, it will always be against Mike Tidd. Um, and I think, you know, if, if a real estate professional could set their, their sights on something like that to say, you know, if there's an exercise I once made some of my subordinates do in the battalion, right? Write your, write what you want your obituary to say. Mm. And nobody puts in their obituary, like showed up at eight in the morning every day on time. Like I was always, you know, it's never the stuff that takes you away from your family. You want it to say things like, 
Well, I was a good, he was a good father. He was a good friend. His kids loved him, respected member of the community. Like, like all of those things, like that's Mike Tid, you know, to a T. And I think, you know, as a real estate professional, if you understand the impact you can have on someone and think about what would your tombstone say about you for if all of those folks in the community showed up to your funeral, how do you, how do you want that to read? Right. So look at it like that. The impact you can have on those families and their lives is important. I love that. Yeah. I mean, really, whatever your profession approach, That's right. approach with purpose, Yeah. it's like building a city with purpose, Yeah. you know, find, find meaning and, and by creating an impact with value for the long term, not just the transactional of the moment. Yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah. And then, you know, to the military family, find those people and they're hard to find, right? But you find them by forming good relationships with other people in the military, with being active in your community and knowing, you know, who you can go to within your community. And then when that posting occurs, when you've got a PCS to the next base, reaching out to the people you know to say, who should I work with? Who would you recommend? And then understanding that you got to find that fit right? Um, you got to find the right fit because that's the person that's going to help you, you know, set yourself, set you up for success in that next, you know, that short term might only be for a year. It might be five. That's fantastic perspective. Yeah, really it's, you know, avoiding those that are, that are going to serve you with apathy Mm. and, and finding those that are going to serve you with advocacy. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Awesome. Thanks for coming in today. Thanks for having me, Tony. Always a pleasure. Cheers. It's always fun. This podcast is about real estate with intelligence. It is pulling the sword from the stone. This podcast is about that unique balance in real estate, that balance between technological intelligence and our emotional intelligence and the transactions and interactions with one another in the real estate process. That's why we're inviting expert guests, people who are knowledgeable and bring different perspective. Join me in exploring this fascination, the look behind the scenes of technological advancement and how it's interacting with people's decisions in real estate.